title of this week's parsha kedoshim means holy ones in hebrew because the lord called us to be holy or set apart and also because we are currently counting the omer which is a time of spiritual refining i hope we can focus on ways we can become more like our lord yeshua as you may have noticed from the video's title this week's message is part two in a series so its format is a bit different from other videos on this channel so far because this topic is of such a serious nature i didn't want anything to be potentially understood out of context so this week's video contains last week's message within it this means if you haven't seen part one of this series Mot, please watch this video from the beginning to get the full meaning of what i am intending to say through the series if you have seen Mot already please feel free to skip ahead to after the my testimony section by using the slider below the video to access the new content you can also click on one of chapter markers in the description box. If you have a different point of view or have anything else to share about what I am stating in this video, as long as everything stays respectful and edifying, please feel free to include it in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Again, for those who haven't seen part one yet, there's no need to go to a different video because part one will begin now. I pray it is a blessing. For those who have seen part one, please feel free to skip ahead to part two, Kedoshi. Many blessings. This week's portion, Acharei Mot, means after the death in Hebrew, and it speaks about what happened after the death of the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, who offered strange fire before the Lord. Now there is endless speculation about what constituted this strange fire, and there is also infinite conjecture as to why what these two individuals committed resulted in their demise. However, I won't be going into that for this video. This particular year, 2024, Parsha Acharei Mot occurred right after Passover, or Pesach. After all of the death that is discussed during Pesach, especially the death of the firstborn, I was looking forward to working on a more lighthearted topic for this week's video. Nevertheless, the title of this Parsha, After the Death, has recurred incessantly in my mind during these past few weeks. During that time, as I prayed to the Lord about what this week's video should be about, I came across a YouTube video about the Holocaust, which went on to describe various reasons why people deny that it ever happened. After many requests for confirmation, the Lord made it clear that the premise of that particular video would constitute part, but not all, of the idea behind this week's message. Firstly, for reasons I do not want to delve into right now, I do not like to personally use the term Holocaust to refer to the incident which began in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and lasted well into World War II, with the spread of the Nazi regime throughout Europe. So for the purposes of this video, I will refer to that one singular long-lasting event as the Shoah, which means destruction in Hebrew. The term Shoah will be used from time to time as we proceed through this video. Furthermore, what I am about to state here might not be a very popular stance, but I must say that I am a die-hard believer in people's fundamental right to believe whatever they want to believe. I will hopefully never say to anyone that they need to believe what I say, or that they should adhere to any preconceived set of beliefs promoted by anyone, except what is in the scriptures. I may not accept other people's views or adopt their views into my own life, but with regards to certain aspects of history, I pray that people will do their own research and that the Lord will ultimately guide people to their own conclusions. Back to the video about the denial of the Shoah, I do believe that the Shoah actually happened, but I do respect people's right to believe that it didn't happen and their right to state as much. That is just their right, and I would never want to infringe on anyone's right to believe what they want to believe or say what they want to say. Part of the video that I mentioned a bit ago was exploring whether or not to censor articles and videos from people who are posting online that the show didn't happen, and also limiting their ability to state as such. I firmly believe that infringing on others' rights to believe and speak what they want only leads to totalitarianism, which includes the very sort of thinking that gave rise to the Shoah itself in the first place, and the type of thought process we are trying to avoid if we want to make things better in this world. Instead of quieting people who think differently, I believe we should get to the roots behind why we think the way we do in the first place. And unfortunately, none of us are exempt from prejudice, including myself, as you will soon see in a testimony I will be sharing with you. Also, this video is not going to try to prove whether or not the show took place. There are enough videos and articles out there that can help you if you are not sure about it. That being said, the Shoah, whether you believe it happened or not, is not the first or only time that the Jews were reportedly slated for mass annihilation or elimination from society. For the purposes of this video, we are going to remove the Shoah from the equation, even though we can keep it in the back of our minds, as we work towards our goal of understanding and mending the many tremendous rifts that exist among people today. 
Of course, I am not a historian or a biblical scholar by any means, but there are things we can find through the scriptures and widely known facts from throughout history that can bring certain mindsets to light. I will not read all of these categories aloud, so if you would like to read them for yourself, please feel free to pause the video for each slide. Biblically, Historically, England 1290, Spain 1492, Russia 1880s to 1910s, Germany 1933 to 1957. In researching for this video, I discovered that even America is not exempt from past anti-Semitism. USA 1862. For a more complete list, please view the Wikipedia article at the link on your screen. In this section, I also felt led to include a part about anti-Semitism in the church. As I mentioned in the Tribulation Part 2 video, which begins with my explanation of what Messianic Judaism really is, I go on to say that as the first disciples of Yeshua were Jewish, and then the Catholic Church took over and outlawed Judaism and Sabbath-keeping Jews and followers of Yeshua the Jewish Messiah, a belief that the Jews were responsible for the death of the Messiah became entrenched and made the Jews villains throughout history, even to this day. My family knows from experience that even the mention to Christians of returning to the Torah has made many of them quite angry, and they are not willing to accept the idea even for a moment. If only everyone could realize that Yeshua was a Jew. He kept the Torah and wanted all of his followers to do the same. Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Currently, I have been told that since the beginning of the Israel-Hamas war in late 2023, public anti-Semitic sentiments are on the rise, even among Christians who appear to be siding with the enemies of Israel. Now again, I am not taking sides because in each dispute there are always two or more sides to every story. The situation is so very complicated, but the part that affects me is that now I am Jewish myself after converting to Messianic Judaism. So anti-Semitism directly affects me and my family. Yeshua said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So this video is my humble attempt to be a peacemaker, and I hope you will stay with me as I attempt to reveal what has been happening and what we can possibly do to heal things, or at least people's understanding, with the ultimate goal of bringing His peace or shalom to God's people far and wide so that we can better learn to love one another. I would like to share with you an incident of prejudice, not anyone else's but my own, and how the Lord used this incident to change my life and forever change the way I think about others. If you have already heard me relate this story before, please feel free to skip ahead to the next section, but for those who haven't heard it, I pray it is helpful to you somehow. I really didn't want to share this, but if only one person out there listens to this message and is blessed by it, then it has all been worth it. One day a few years ago, I was working on ministry paperwork on the computer, and as I worked, I was watching, or more like listening to, a 90s YouTube video of my favorite violin concerto by my all-time favorite violinist who happens to be Jewish. The orchestra that performed in that video is from Germany, and the conductor of the orchestra, who will remain nameless, but many of you may guess who he is, looked very intense and angry as he directed the music. Now to be clear, I am not anti-German. I just happen to be part German myself. I am, or was, against certain ideologies, or bigoted against bigotry, like the Nazis and racists, so to speak. As I looked up from my work to see the concerto for a moment, in that split second I looked at the conductor's posture, demeanor, appearance, and angry scowl and thought to myself, he's probably a Nazi. It was almost like time stopped and I heard a voice say, look him up. That request sounded reasonable, so that's promptly what I did. After just a few clicks on the computer, I learned that not only was this conductor not a Nazi, he was actually a Jewish man himself, who was actually longtime best friends with the aforementioned favorite Jewish violinist. For the next few weeks, I was relentless, going out rabbit trail after rabbit trail, learning about this prodigiously gifted conductor, classical pianist, and all-around musician. This man was born and lived a good part of his young life in a country where Nazis and Jews actually lived in harmony together, thus he didn't comprehend what prejudice was. At the age of 10, he and his family moved to Israel. Later in life, he co-founded an orchestra which unites people of different nations and religions, including Israelis and Muslims, to play beautiful pieces of music together as one. This man would take his musicians on tours of former concentration and death camps throughout Europe to help them experience firsthand the impact that hatred and prejudice have on the world. 
I would love to write a letter to this man thanking him for his contribution to humanity and for embodying our Lord Yeshua's blessed are the peacemakers. As of today, this gentleman is still alive and somehow I hope that the Lord shows him, maybe even through this video, how much his life story and the works he has done has impacted my life. And ever since that experience, which has been one of the most eye-opening and impactful moments of my life and which I will always keep in the back of my mind, I apologize profusely to the Lord. I apologize to this amazing conductor and musician wherever he is. And I am sternly reminded of how blind and wrong I or any of us could possibly be in judging someone else and to try my very best not to make snap judgments about people ever again. I still mess up from time to time, as we all do, but I pray for improvements in that area of my life every day. Continuing in this video series with Parsha Kedoshin, this week's message is not for the faint of heart because it may show us, myself included, with some visual examples where we may have some work to do in our spiritual lives in order to be the holy ones He wants us to be. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Without further ado, His brave spiritual warriors, let's put on the whole armor of God and get into it. Now we will go a little bit into some of the different ways that we can be prejudiced towards others from what is in my opinion the simplest to the most complicated and ways that we can potentially combat them. These are just general categories and there are more that I didn't mention like ability levels and at times each of the following categories can blend into each other and or we may experience one or more of these categories together in different situations. One, color and appearance. Like most typical chicken eggs, may be white or brown on the outside. Thankfully, we are all the same on the inside. Personally, I just love the diversity of skin tones that the Lord created throughout the world. As a side note, and as a newsflash maybe to some people, those who are considered white, like myself, are not really white. One day I was blown away when someone mentioned that every human being on the planet Earth has a skin tone like some type of soil. Remember, the Lord created humankind from the Earth. From the lightest beige sand on tropical beaches to the darkest, loamiest volcanic soil, each type of soil is valuable and precious in its own way, and combining the soils actually enhances the benefits of each. Adding sand to clay soil improves its drainage. Adding loamy soil to sandy soil improves its ability to retain water and nutrients, etc. Tragically, not only can people be potentially evaluated, excluded, or persecuted by the color of their skin, but other types of physical appearance can be a big factor in how people are judged. We can look at how people are dressed, which may or may not indicate their financial status, which we are warned not to do. And people can also be judged by their physical characteristics, which can include facial features, body shape, etc. People even exclude or insult people, whether intentionally or unintentionally, based on these factors. As I mentioned in the When God Calls video, the Lord actually prefers the poor. And like I mentioned in the Behind the Veil head covering video, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Little about our exterior is of much value to God, whether it be our skin color, material possessions, or physical characteristics of any kind. Instead of judging and excluding others based on their outer appearance, I pray we can all celebrate and appreciate the uniqueness and diversity of the appearances that the Lord blesses each with individually. 2. Nationality and Ethnicity The Lord loves the people of all the nations. The word goyim in Hebrew, which sadly can be used as an insult, merely means nations. In all honesty, I am not fiercely patriotic. I am not against people that are, but I personally am not. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate that I was born and raised in the country I am in. I pray for this country and its leaders, and I love and pray for blessings upon every part of this beautiful country and the people in it. However, I don't believe that any nation, not even my own, is better than any other. Even though each country has its flaws, I am certain I can find at least one thing to admire, like foods, traditions, language, architecture, etc., in each country on the earth. Sometimes nationalism can escalate, as it has so many times throughout the ages, into full-on war. That is the thought process behind ethnic cleansing, especially when one nationality or culture believes that they are superior or good, and the other group is inferior or evil, and should be eliminated, or at the very least, excluded and hated. To confirm this, there is a song lyric from a famous animated movie about settlers arriving from England to the New World. Referring to the natives, the leader of the British colony says, they're not like you and me, which means they must be evil. We must sound the drums of war. In a sensitive topic, God loves Israel, but I believe he truly loves spiritual Israel, which are those who keep his commands. 
Not that I don't love the nation of Israel as it exists today. I do. But as all countries do, it has its flaws. I believe physical Israel and spiritual Israel are two very different things. I believe that spiritual Israel is actually the kingdom of God, a perfect world governed by our Lord Yeshua himself, where everyone serves each other and loves one another, looking past what country or ethnic group someone may have come from, because in his kingdom we are all brothers and sisters. In Yeshua we are all citizens of Israel, heaven, and the household of God. There are many times where the Lord says he will welcome the Goyim to himself. God's desire is for nation not to rise up against nation anymore, and when his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, that will most certainly happen. I pray that the beauty inherent in each nationality and ethnicity will become a celebration of diversity instead of division. 3. Religion and Beliefs Holy wars, including the Israel-Hamas war that is currently happening as of the date of this video, many times happen because one religion has hatred for the other religion. But if we really think about it, the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that are all embroiled in this horrible war are all family, as in close and not too distant relatives. As I mentioned in the Tribulation Part 2 video, Christianity at its core is just a sect of Judaism that accepted Yeshua as their Messiah, because all of the earliest Christians were devout Jews. Those individuals from non-Jewish nations that accepted the Messiah after the resurrection were grafted into Israel, as are we who grew up as Christians and then learned or will learn about the Jewish roots of our faith now later in life, like my family did. I wholeheartedly believe Christianity was never meant to split off from Judaism as it did in the 300s under Constantine and the early Roman Catholic Church. So the Crusades, the Inquisitions, and all of the times the Jews have been expelled out of Christian countries, as mentioned earlier, has all been brother fighting and hating brother for differences that are not even really there in the first place. Now I see all Christians as Jews, they just don't know it, and even though they may never want to admit it, we can't escape our heritage. For more about this, please click on the Tribulation Part 2 video that will be in the end screen. Furthermore, Muslim people are also children of Abraham, so many Muslims are currently accepting Yeshua, or Isa as they call him, as their Lord and Savior, especially during these last days, and as such are being grafted into Israel as we speak. As such, there should really not be all of this discord between all of Abraham's children. God said that by Abraham, all nations would be blessed, especially through his descendants, whether they be his children naturally or grafted in by faith. I pray with all of my heart, all of this turmoil and animosity will end quickly and be replaced with the love that we were all meant to have for one another. Beliefs can not only be religious, but can also encompass political views and other ideologies. If you have heard the phrase, don't discuss religion and politics, I will do just that and stay out of any specifics. But I believe the same idea applies. We all want to do what's right. Even our political or ideological opponents truly believe that what they are believing and doing has merit and is done with good motives and intentions. The danger comes when we believe that the other side is wrong or even worse, out to get us. That can easily lead to paranoia or worse, make us develop a hair trigger, ready to react offensively or violently at the slightest provocation, whether real or imagined. May that never be true for any of us. I pray that we can discuss our differences with people who do believe differently than we do with an open mind and not with animosity and hatred in our hearts. Number four, actions and sins. This one seems to be the most difficult one in attempting to discern how to treat others. If someone treats us badly or if they hurt someone we love, it is the easiest thing in the world to want to remove them from our lives or worse still, make it appear that they do not even exist. I am saddened for any abuse or loss anyone may experience and I surely cannot give any pat answers or simple solutions on how to react to any particular instance. However, what I can say is that the Lord wants us to forgive. Yeshua made this clear throughout all of his teachings, but you may also be surprised that it is mentioned in the Torah as well. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It is definitely not easy. Sometimes it is the hardest thing we will ever have to do, and each person's God-given measure of faith will indicate their level of forgiveness towards others and what he wants us to tolerate and what he doesn't want us to tolerate. Trusting versus not trusting, separation for abuse and adultery, boundaries, etc. I am not the forgiveness expert by any means, because I still struggle in this area as well, as we all do. But the Lord gave me some insights about forgiveness from a particular experience in my life, and I would like to share what he gave me with you. It is a free ebook called Forgiveness, and it is available on our website, yeshuastemple.com or don'tgiveupministries.com. The forgiveness book was written back when I was a Christian, before I began my Messianic journey, and I have not had time to update it. 
Hopefully I will someday. So certain terms like Jesus may be present, but on the whole, spirit and message of the book remain the same. I pray it is a blessing if you are having trouble forgiving someone in your life, even forgiving God, whom we can sometimes believe doesn't care and who allows terrible things to happen in this world to us and people we love. Back when my hubby and I began ministry, we learned about a make-believe object affectionately called the reset button. When there is some kind of argument or just ill feelings two people may have towards each other, either one or both can push this reset button in their minds and start all over again. The stipulation for using it is that you cannot go back and bring up anything that happened before pushing the button. We have seen this amazing gadget in action, and it has worked wonders for marriages and friendships alike. Unfortunately, this product is not sold in stores, but fortunately, we are able to create this button in our minds. Going back to hatred and disagreements that exist between people, currently a question that is looming larger in my mind lately is, what if it's all just a big misunderstanding? If we seek to understand where someone else is coming from, instead of only seeing our own point of view, we might be able to overcome some of these obstacles to seeing eye to eye with others. If you are sensitive like me, we may look at someone with a scowl or who avoids us upon entering the room as someone being hateful, antisocial, or critical of us. But like in my example from earlier, what if that is not the case at all? What if the person is merely having a bad day? What if the person has a genetic propensity to having an angry looking face? What if the person is distracted and or concentrating intently on something that has nothing to do with us? What if the person is shy or has difficulty relating to people or perhaps avoids people due to past hurts of their own? We can never really know until we put our guard down and really try to get the chance to know the person and I believe it is best for us not to prejudge people if we can at all avoid it. Now I would never want to explain away or justify what happened in Nazi Germany and I pray that what happened never be tolerated or allowed to happen again. However, as I have been seeking to understand what caused all of this to happen, I realized that there was something even larger at play. The Nazi leader of Germany at that time, who will not be named, was a very tormented and injured man who as a child was beaten to the point of being in a coma by his father and who had many emotional problems he was trying to overcompensate with by becoming ruthless and uncompromising as an adult. I have witnessed firsthand many times that the old saying is true, hurt people hurt people. I believe that when someone is hurt or oppressed or they feel hurt or oppressed, one of the first and most natural reactions is to retaliate or seek revenge that is what I believe happened with this person. To sum it up, in his eyes, the Jews were to blame for all of the problems that Germany faced after World War I. I don't believe they actually were. It was just a big misunderstanding that, fueled by the overwhelming bias that already existed in his society, was fanned into the creation of a political party whose priority it was to destroy the Jews. Furthermore, this man judged the whole religion and culture based on the perceived actions of just a few people. There are people who make good and bad choices in all walks of life, but in not forgiving the Jews for the part he and the other Nazis believed the Jews played in the outcome of the war, something else more dreadful happened. Led by this man, this group became even more oppressive, hateful, greedy, and manipulative than what they had ever accused the Jews of being, which leads me to my next point. One thing that is very dangerous about not forgiving others is that we eventually become the very person we didn't forgive in the first place. It may not happen at first because we feel so entitled to not forgive and angry at the person or people who hurt us that we'll say to ourselves, I will never do that or I will never be like that person, thus sowing seeds of bitterness and unforgiveness in our heart. These seeds tend to grow very slowly, sometimes taking years to produce fruit. Then one day, maybe decades down the line, we may potentially say, what have I done? After doing the same thing that person did. Worse yet, sometimes we can't see the transformation that has occurred in ourselves, but others can. They may say, what happened to you? Or, you're just like that person. Please see the passage of the unforgiving servant. That is why I believe Yeshua was so clear and why he reiterated so often that we were to forgive others. Because, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Because if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Counting the Omer, a spiritual refining. Right now, in this year that this video is being posted to this channel, we have officially begun counting the Omer, which is the 50-day time of renewal between Bikurim, or First Fruits, and Shavuot, or Pentecost. This is a time when we all customarily reflect on our spiritual condition and seek more obedience to the Lord's word. Shavuot is the time to commemorate the receiving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and it is also the day we remember another important event, 
On the day of his ascension, Yeshua told his disciples, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. As we journey through this time leading up to Shavuot, we want to let you all know about a new free Yeshua's Temple app we created to help you count the Omer each year, which includes the daily blessing, the count of each day, and the 50 days of scripture passages that are relevant for our spiritual growth in Yeshua. The link to the app is available on yeshuastemple.com, which will be linked below. The app also includes this month's calendar, so you can see which day we are currently on. This app will only be available during the 50-day counting of the Omer each year, as the Lord is willing. We hope it is helpful. Thank you so much for staying to the end of this video. May your Achorei Mot and Kedoshim Shabbat be blessed with the eternal love of our Messiah Yeshua, and may the Lord richly bless all of you and your families.